are pleased to welcome you to the Winthrop King Institute. Um, so happy to have you here, Edouard Duval Carrier. I'm more than delighted to be here. I'd like to begin um, by asking about your piece, My Life as a Tree. Much of what has been published about you gives great attention to your biographical narrative. Having been uprooted from your native country of Haiti, you crossed the Caribbean, living in exile in Puerto Rico, and later in the United States and Canada. Then you moved across the Atlantic to live in France and have now planted yourself in Miami. So what does the concept of having roots or being rooted in a place mean to you? And how do you use the image of the tree to tell your story? Well, the first question is, isn't that what everybody does, move from place to place? <laughs> Uh, no, but yes, uh, I left uh, Haiti uh, very early on, nine years old. So I'm as Puerto Rican as can be as well. Speak Spanish and very, very in tune with what's happening there, what happened when I was there. Moved along. But, and, uh, but at one point I had to realize that, yes, I was that this tree with uprooted, you know, with the roots looking for roots. I think maybe I found it. I've been long enough in Miami now, more than 20 years. It's, I mean, I can't even fathom that, you know, how long that has been. And um, I feel at ease in a place like Miami because of its um, proximity to, to the Caribbean. It's, I mean, to me, it's the North Caribbean. I mean, it's, yes, it's an American city with all of the appanage of, you know, like of an American metropolis and all of these things. But at the same time, the, the people that have gravitated there tend to be either Latin Americans and, and Caribbean people. And I feel very much at ease. I mean, I'm, it's the only, probably the only neighborhood um, in contemporary United States that has the name of Haiti attached to it with a little Haiti neighborhood. And I'm right in the middle of it. <laughs> which I'm quite delighted about. Wonderful. Um, you are often called upon to represent Haiti's image. For example, you direct the Little Haiti Cultural Center in Miami. I'm not totally the director. Anyways, okay. continue the okay. question. <laughs> <laughs> um, will you organize the Global Caribbean Series for Art Basel, Miami? So how do you perceive of your role to represent Haiti in and perhaps for the contemporary art world? The, 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 my, it, it's probably my reaction to Paris because yeah, I was a guest of the French government and uh, as far as uh, uh, invited to participate in the bicentennial when they, of the French Revolution, I mean, very much part of, you know, like the, the, that particular event. And then suddenly, you know, like the interest for the Caribbean or for me or for anything else from that region, you know, like just waned. And I felt, you know, like that, uh, that I needed to, and I wanted to be part of, I mean, and I tried to mount programs for the French government or, or with some agencies there, cultural agencies there. They did, they did, you know, like cater to me a little bit, but I found that it was not enough. And also there was not enough of a Haitian or Caribbean population, you know, like, got, you know, like centered in, in, in France, even though they are, there are, you know, like the, uh, the Martinique and Guadeloupe contingency, but they are French citizens. It's not really that you're speaking of a, of a group from a region, and, and that has been their problem also. I will tell you a little bit more about it. Um, so I felt that moving back to a place like Miami, I mean, which was very central to, to, to the Caribbean and to the rest of Latin America, I mean, could, have, could be a, a very... Um, profitable for the region and for me to act, interact because I feel that my role just as a pr to promote myself on a daily basis is sometimes very embarrassing and I'm not the type that likes to do that. So I, I, I prefer to make core with groups of artists or with an idea or with a project and present it and, and, uh, and this is going to be the case with my presence here right now but we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, Yes, I mean, it was fortuitous that I bought a place in Little Haiti because I, that was my intent. There is, as I just said, it's the only place, you know, like in the United States that has the, the name of Haiti attached to it. So, I mean, yeah, I, I felt very happy to be around and to form this organization that we have called the Haitian Cultural Arts Alliance. Then I found out there, that they were building a whole cultural center. I was going to be evicted. Then they realized that I could be of interest to, to the whole thing, so they left me there. 
So, you know, it's a, it's a cultural center, very well appointed, very beautiful architecturally by one of the be better architects in Miami. And um, it has, you know, like some Caribbean touch, but very modern. So it's not a pastiche, a Disney version of, of what, kid, what one expects to, the Caribbean to be. And um, here I was. So, I mean, they looked upon me also to mount projects because I had this organization that I was heading, which was a platform for to support the arts. So we've, I've talked to friends from, from France and they had la just launched a major program called uh, creati Creativity in the Caribbean. I mean, the, the French AID prog projects are usually cultural. I mean, you know, it's very funny that they get a lot of attention for that. Meanwhile, other countries such as Japan give Haiti, you know, like $5 billion worth of tubing, and they get a two line below three pages of cultural <laughs> activity, which is, <laughs> I think they, they, they know what they're doing at that level. Anyways, they were very, uh, they, they, they supported the program for the duration of their mandate, which was a five year mandate to help uh, promote the contemporary arts from the region. And I had to twist their arm to say that presenting it in Paris was not enough. That, you know, like the proximity of Miami to the Caribbean demanded that, you know, like that, that these artists be presented in a, in a, in a solid way. And with, uh, I mean, with, I mean, some project that would be well done, well presented with some sort of funding, you know, like so that the artist could come or the art could come because it's very expensive to be shipping, you know, like very large installations or whatever. It's not little postcard things that we were presenting. It was like the, the usual contemporary art, you know, like installations and things. Sometimes, you know, like they were very daunting to, to move around. Anyways, they accepted, we did it. And um, hold and behold, I think that it had its impact in the sense that Miami reali has realized also its positioning in the art world and the art market, they have to bring, they have to bring something, you know, like to the table. And I think that they've realized that, you know, like the, that their, the proximi their proximity to, to the Caribbean region is of utmost importance. It's a region that has yet to be studied thoroughly. It's history, I mean, or it's art history or whatever that, that, that can mean. I know some countries have more better projects or better sense of that kind of things, you know, like uh, uh, right now, but I mean, they, they acquiesced and the city has realized that they could benefit by promoting and their positioning, you know, as a regional capital, rather than just being the third wheel of New York, Paris or London, which is, you know, like there's still, they're still in, an infight about that because, you know, of course they want to be the, the latest in, in contemporary art and stuff like that, which dictates that the world, you know, like should be interested. But I think they should you know, I like present something in a, in a more, because I mean, of course, France has, has its own academics, its own, you know, like pr a promotion system and stuff like that. And so does, you know, like cities like New York, Chicago and uh, LA. So, you know, like in Miami, what does it have to offer? So, you know, I mean, they've realized that maybe probably, you know, like that could be a good thing. So they've started very quietly, very timidly, but they're doing it. And, um, and artists that had presented in my first editions of Ro Global Caribbean has accessed walls of museums in Miami. So I'm delighted about that. <laughs> I'd like to talk um, in particular about your own work. Mm -hmm. um, your landscape paintings are astounding, sometimes dark and haunting, other times lively and energized with pigments. Uh, canonically, Haiti and more broadly the Caribbean are places that have been represented by lush landscapes but omit the human body. How does your work engage with a historic image of the Caribbean? I couldn't have said it better than you just said it. <laughs> <laughs> the, this, the, 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 there's a brand new museum, I don't know if you're aware of it, called the Perez Museum, which was built, I mean, in the last four or five years. Very beautiful museum very well appointed, I mean, and uh, they've offered me, you know, like early, uh, I mean, as soon as it opened, I, I was scheduled to do a show there. And of course, people know me in Miami, so I had, I was forced to, I mean, what do I do to bring something new to the table? And that would speak to, to the public in Miami, as well as speak to the Caribbean and to look a bit at, at the history. So I decided to revisit the Hudson School because they were very much involved in, especially in the period when, you know, like the acquisition of the Floridas, you know, like, and, and some islands in, in the Caribbean, you know, like, and the Monroe Doctrine, you know, like the United States flexing its muscles against Europe. I mean, to, you know, like to create this market, you know, like that would be hemispheric. 
and uh, um, of course, you know, like the usual market systems, you know, like where do I sell my sugar, where should I sell my coffee, which were the European buyers, were suddenly, you know, like cut off from the from the equation, and uh, the State Department had to figure out a way to, you know, like to compensate. So they did send, you know, like, I don't know if it was done. I mean, in some certain some cases, it was a directive. You know, like, let's see what these places can offer to investors in New York, Chicago, and elsewhere. So, you know, like, there was a scramble to the Caribbean and to, the Latin, and to South America as well to recreate, you know, like, a visual so that people could know the same way they had done it when they discovered America. You know, like, they presented, you know, like, major cities like in Mexico City, Tenochtitlan, and stuff like that as empty places. And it was like part of that tradition of presenting these new territories as if they were virgin. Well, we all know that these were plantation economies full of slaves working on and tilling land and stuff like that. And suddenly, in the 19th century, you have a, the recreation of the Caribbean as this luscious par pa paradise, you know? So it's, uh, it's, to me, it was always a disconnect. And I just wanted to play with the idea and have people rethink this. this. And Miami suffers or is part of that project. It still you know, like presents itself as a sea sun beaches when it was a, a swamp full of malaria and mosquitoes and all sorts of nasty things, you know? And they've managed to do it very successfully. I mean, it's a beautiful place. I mean, it's one of the most beautiful cities today. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm totally Miami, yeah, yeah, as you can see. <laughs> and uh, um, it's, it was well received and the, the, the people got the point that there was an agenda behind you know, this Im imagery that, um, that was presented in the late and early 20th century, uh, late 19th, early 20th, you know, like concerning these islands. Some of them have very successfully, you know, like abide by, by these projects, you know, like and could be creating themselves as tourist havens and, and places, I mean, tourist destinations while maintaining their, their, their sugar and, and their production, their usual production. So there's always a disconnect with what you expect and what there is when you visit these islands. So I just wanted to talk about that with that work. And by placing everything at night, you know, you create immediately some mystery. What's behind that, those plants? What's lurking behind, you know, so. Right. Well, your work in the visual arts isn't limited to paintings, um, but also includes sculpture and mixed media. Can you talk about your process in, as an artist who employs multiple approaches to the visual arts? What materials are you drawn to? Oh, I, I'm, I'm, my, my studios uh, uh, is, is, is more akin to a kitchen than to anything else. I use all types of products. Probably that's my only, I mean, I'm very history oriented, politically, ad, political agendas here and there. I mean, histories and stuff like that. But I'm also very conscious of, um, the fact that I'm an artist and that I'm playing with very specific materials. And I'm always trying, that's where I push my envelope. You understand? And you're trying to find new materials. I mean, I've heard today that there was a 3D printing uh, facility here. You better believe I'm coming back. <laughs> and uh, to play with that. But I mean, e e and uh, it's been, you know, like a constant in my work. And I've evo I mean, I started as a simple, simple, easel painter, you know, with my canvas and my oils. I mean, I dropped that very early on and played with all sorts of materials. For example, the, the work that I did that you were referring to, the, the Imagine Landscape, is you, I'm, I think I revived one industry single-handedly, which is the glitter glue. <laughs> the glitter glue industry. Uh, anyways, I've used so much of it in that thing. Uh, by using uh, by using that, it, I had to find a way to fix it, you know, because it, after more, after a month or two, you know, like the, the, when the glue dried, the, the glitter started falling. So I had to find a way. So I, of course, you know, I looked into resins and all types of things until I got a, a one that's like UV resistant that will not turn black on me. After a while, to make sure that my client, if anybody bought them, you know, like they wouldn't be screaming at me in the next, <laughs> at least. When I'm dead, fine, they can figure it out. But while I'm alive, they would be calling me, what happened to my painting? Why is it bright yellow right now, you know? Anyways, so I, li I, I like to play with materials. And um, right now, I'm going to be doing very large sculptures, but in styrofoam. And I'm using 3D printing. That's why I'm very interested to see. I found a company that can, you know, like if I make a sketch, they will be able to cut the foam 
to almost to the, to the scale and to the image that I might want to produce. Of course, I'll have to work zillions of hours on it to make it look like something else than styrofoam. And um, so these are going to be part of my next project and probably part of it will be coming here because this project, the project I'll be, I'll be working on is about plants, plants as commodities. I just did a, a, a show for the globe, my Global Caribbean this year was looking at um, I decided to drop this contemporary thing all the time because I mean I live in a neighborhood which is mostly recent arrival immigrants and it's very traditional I mean a very traditional kind of and they are not totally understanding of the this contemporary um, a facet of of art so they're always complaining why is there a piece of wood on the floor <laughs> or comments of the sort so I decided to give them a little bit more meat for their understanding. So I decided to go uh, with uh, uh, the Brown University and we did a very interesting show on what Africa brought to the table in the sense of what are the commodities that were brought by the slave, were consumed by the slave and are still being consumed today on a general basis. And behold and behold, there are plenty of things from things like the banana, which, you know, like, and sugar, to things like co cola, Coca-Cola. Cola is an African product. You know, which <laughs> people forget that. Yeah, you know, and uh, apparently it was used in the, during the, the transatlantic trade to keep the water either tasty or, or clean because it has antiseptic qualities. So they would just add it after a while to the water that was going tepid or, or, or horrible. And they added just a little bit of honey and you had your first cola. There you go. <laughs> Well, that's very interesting, and it connects to my, my thought when I look at a lot of your work, is that not only are my visual perceptors being engaged, but my other sensory experiences, such as the sense of taste, for example. You mentioned your studio is like that, is like a kitchen. Yes. <laughs> um, so would it, would it be fair to say that you're reimagining the visual history of the Caribbean in favor of one that's multisensorial, perhaps more embodied? The point is that it's always been done. People don't realize how important, you know, like certain commodities have been to the, to the arts. And uh, it, this came to me when, uh, first of all, I, met, I, I visited France and realized that the whole, you know, like, how would I say, the, the, the best of France, I mean, like the golden years, the golden age of a French painting and stuff like that, is, coincides with the, with the uh, production of sugar. And what they called golden age of France is the era of refinement, but it also is the era of sugar refinement. And the two apply all the, all the terminology for, you know, like for, you know, like the way you painted in that period of glaçage, cirage, and all these things that the French do at that period, in that period, you know, like to make sure that everything is luscious. It look, they look like cakes. When you went to the, I mean, the first thing I could bring to mind is these paintings look like somebody, you know, like knew how to apply icing to cake <laughs> and to me that's what it's all about so there is that element of you know like and and, and from then on i realized that there is that sensory with the end of the, the the how would i say the the omnibulation of artists with food also is a very pattern in all of their work so you know like i mean i'm not and i don't escape that formula that format <laughs> So at present, right now, we're currently located in North Florida, just miles from the Georgia border, and you've spent some time researching the history of this region of the United States, as I understand. Um, and as we know, the location of your studio in South Florida and Miami is of critical importance to your work. So what is it that draws you to Florida, and how is it that this re region connects? To your art? It's first, well, I mean, this came about, I mean, first of all, Florida, when I got there, I mean, yes, of course, I, I saw that I was coming to this new uh, desti artistic, contemporary artistic destination. And I realized that it's a city that's formed, that has a history, even though people claim it doesn't. And that especially, and, and the rest of, and the United States, we're part of a whole history. You know, like part and parcel of a whole history, which you know, like basically, uh, is you know, like discovery of a new world. You know, like the the, you know, like looking at commodities internationally, and trying to create promote these commodities and trying to produce these commodities. I mean, the the, the incapacity for the Europeans to create to 
do these commodities on their own. So the, the importation of slaves, which had the know-how, they just they were not just hands. They just had, knew how to to they, because they are from the tropical fringe. So you know, like the first places to be to be uh, occupied in this new world were the, was the Caribbean, and you know, like I mean, it was you know, like what do we do with all this new land that we have? Uh, what do you know, like what can we do that that creates value immediately? So you know, like I mean, I'm very interested in you know, like how these commodities were brought, cultivated. And you know, like the United States also, you know, like doing the same kind of things at the time, and all, and as they're going south in their expansion, you understand what do they do with their tropical, you know, like fringe, and hence you know, like the sugar was tried, then other indigo was tried, and that's what I'm looking at. You know, like were they aware, more aware of what was happening in the Caribbean than they claimed they 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 did. And apparently they certainly had like very strong contacts and moving along, you know, like commodities between the Caribbean and, and, and this south, south region to the point that, you know, like, I mean, people had moved back and forth, you know, like there's a lot of histories that, are, that have been, you know, like swept or put aside, but are, that are very existent. And also the impact of the Haitian Revolution, which followed very closely the, the, the American Revolution. And there's a big connection between that. that. So that was looked upon very seriously, you know, like uh, continental wise, the Ameri I mean, American side. And what was the reaction to that? So they thought, oh, they're not going to be producing the sugar anymore. We're going to jump the bandwagon and start producing sugar and realize that it was not as simple as they thought. Up to, you know, like, to the discussion of, of you know, were they going to hold slavery? here in this country, then the decision not to do so because cotton became, you know, like the new commodity in vogue, which the United States jumped upon and became one of the wealthiest nation because of petticoats, <laughs> the production of cloth for petticoats. So that's the, you know, like that's the whole story that I want to bring about, see the connections, see if they are real to tell, because this is all conjecture to me. I'm sure there's enough academics that have looked upon this kind of discourses and stuff like that to make sure that I mean, I mean, probably here I'm at FSU, I'm probably at the most crucial place for me to get these answers and to mount a show or to mount a, a project that will encompass these kind of visions and see, you know, like, I mean, and of course I will create some art around that. But also, you know, like, I mean, I, I like the idea of being very didactic at this point because this is a story that has not been, you know, like, it's not a common thing, you know what I'm saying? It's like, you really have to dig deep, you, you really have to, look at things and, and really go back to records and, and or reconfigure the records or revisit the records in a different atti you know with a different attitude to understand you know like what went on and i know that i'm in the right place because i mean just today at the um, archaeological uh, facilities that that governs in all the parks in the south i mean i was given a mouthful of information <laughs> i was like Okay, <laughs> and I've realized that I mean there's so many little connect. I mean that that the, the, I mean Haiti thinks it's it's very unique in it's the fact that it's like 200 years of independence and alone and doing its own thing, and today I, I saw objects that were from some plantation in in Georgia somewhere that I thought were from Haiti, and they were they were uh, crosses, uh, Congo crosses for cemeteries that are done in Haiti, but exactly the same way. I was just like, this is impossible, because this is like two artists that I know that do this, that probably are from that tradition. But you know, like, I mean, to find them that they've been done, you know, like 100 or 200 years ago, and that they're exactly the same thing that are, that is, is, is I mean, there's a lot of connections there. And connections that, I mean, even me that, that think that, oh, I've seen this, I understand that, I mean, I've, I've looked at that history and realized that it's a much more complex history than, than what, what I even mean, what I thought. So there is a matter for people to look at. I mean, for me to look, revisit, look at and study. And I hope to do something like that with the, with the, with the faculties here and the, the different academic sections here and see, probably you'll get involved and you'll get excited by, you know, like, what is this? <laughs> Right, absolutely. Well, we're fortunate that you're here today. Thank you. And um, on behalf, again, of the Winthrop King Institute for French and Contemporary Francophone Studies, um, we look forward to seeing what your visit um, produces in your future work. Well, I'm certainly be, I mean, we have a whole museum to fill up. So, you know, like, I mean, a lot of people will have to work on this project, which I think is fascinating. And not forgetting the French, you know, like, this is where we are at the configuration of a 
problem that existed two centuries ago and see what it, what it brought about, not only in Haiti, but in the region in general.